hot topic, but this is part of the time frame. Okay. And that was a lot to take in in yes. more ways than one. I went way over my time. I'm sorry, I went into yours. That's where we stand. We agree, it's a miracle. Today is Wednesday, July 20th, 2022, and this is The Batch. Welcome to The Bash, where we bring the analyst and planner to the table to discuss relevant financial and investment topics. We're going to have 60 seconds to discuss each topic. My man, the analyst, Scott, what do you think? We're going to make this happen? It's hot. Hot one today, huh? Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of hot, inflation's hot. And it's on the news. It's everywhere we look. Scott, this is what we hear. Politicians, our friends, clients talking about inflation. And I'm going to turn to you. How bad is it right now? I see you focusing pretty tightly on these reports that are coming out monthly, probably even weekly. I can't even track what you're up to. So when you're looking at inflation, what are your thoughts right now on what's happening? I can't keep my eyes off the screens right now. I don't know whether to look at the camera or look at the screens. I'm sorry. I don't know whose eyes to look at. Because every few minutes, I'm going to get a new indicator. I'm going to find out where inflation was, where it's at now, and what are some of my leading indicators that tells me that uh, I believe later on this year, we'll, we'll start to see a, a rolling over of inflationary data on CPI. Uh, we'll start to see that uh, a fall. Um, right now though, um, inflation is hot, just like it is outside. 9.1% year over year CPI index. Americans are feeling it. They're feeling it at the pump. They're feeling it at the supermarket. They're feeling it in all aspects of life. Uh, however, when we look at some of the inputs, when uh, aluminum, copper, food like wheat and corn, uh, even here at home, we love chicken wings. All of those are down from peak prices year to date. That's a really good sign for the future. I do think that what we're seeing right now in the summer is going to be looked at as peak inflation. We won't know that though for a period of time. Those are the lagging parts. When we look at CPI, we're looking at it in arrears. So I know my clock is up. I mean, it's great that we're spending 60 seconds on inflation. That's right, Scott, 60 seconds. I'm sorry, the hot topic, but this is part of the time frame. So I have mixed feelings right now on inflation. And I'm gonna give you an example why. University of Michigan Index of Consumer Sentiment hit its lowest level on record in June, with nearly half of survey consumers blaming inflation for eroding their living standards. So Scott, you just mentioned we're paying higher prices at the pump, grocery store, and other areas. So right now, it's definitely affecting how consumers feel about inflation. But on the other hand, Scott, sound like you with statistics here, aren't businesses adding more jobs at a solid clip right now? Um, aren't household finances extremely strong, still carried over from the savings during the pandemic? These are all ha uh, factors helping consumers continue um, to be able to spend as inflation surges. Consequently, let's go back to June. Retail sales grew in June by 1%, even with inflation at a 40-year high. So, Scott, when we look at how inflation, it's not it's eroding our confidence, but at the same time, we're staving this off. And I don't know if this is the right saying, but when will the rubber meet the road? When the rubber meets the road. Right now, we're able to withstand inflation. Hopefully, this can keep going on and inflation can start to tick down in the near future. Uh, Matt, let's hope that happens pretty soon. Uh, just for that everyday American out there, uh, that would certainly help. Let's move on a little bit to retirement plans, because what I know is that 42% of retirement plan assets in 401ks are invested in target date funds. Matt, is this a good strategy? Scott, great question. Why don't we first start out what a target date fund is? And to act like you an analyst, I'm going to read a professional definition. I need my glasses. Hmm. A target date fund is a class of mutual funds or ETFs that periodically rebalance asset class weights to optimize risk and returns for a predetermined time frame. It's a lot to take in. Why don't we just say- and That was a lot to take in in yes. more ways than one. That's something, I mean, that was like you reading it. So now we're gonna get down to the real terms here. Going a target date fund, it's like set it and forget it, autopilot. To me, it encompasses generally what someone would wanna invest in for the future based on their potential time horizon. 
I'm not saying it's bad to be in the target fund. I think it depends. And it's good if someone doesn't take the time to really understand their situation. But when it comes to a target date fund, I'll give you an example of where customization probably works better. Take a 60 year old that's in a 2025 fund, potentially could retire in five years, but they have other assets or other variables in their life where they won't need this money for 20 plus years. Being conservative and having 50 plus percent potentially fixed income would show they're not customizing that strategy and a target date fund might not match their specific situation. Scott, what do you think about target date funds? Glasses back on. Oh, go ahead. I'm going to listen to you now. Thank you. Target date funds. Uh, Absolutely. When when you're looking at savings for the long term, when you're looking at dollar cost averaging, paycheck by paycheck, and you're a worker that has many, many years before, sometimes using target date funds is actually the right move. Why? Because so many people don't even step up to the plate. Step in the box, son. Step up to the plate. And invest. And that is the majority of the work that needs to be done because the margin difference long term between target date funds and an asset allocation model that's more tactical, it's going to be razor thin margins. And it's razor thin and getting razor thinner. It's not going to make the material difference of whether or not a retiree could retire and live comfortably. What it will do, however, is for certain investors, they could be able to go deeper into an asset allocation. They could be able to create a more broad lineup and expose their dollars to more areas of the market. They can create better efficiency. They can somewhat target risk. They can be more tactical. And the terminology that I'm using allows everyone to kind of visualize a portfolio that has a more customized approach. And that's what can be done. Wow. So the analyst turned into more of the planning side there, which I love. I mean, we could talk about dollar cost averaging all day, but we were just talking about investing, which you love. And we're going to turn to our next topic, which is also investing. A lot of talk about the 60-40 portfolio being dead. I mean, the stock market had its worst half of the year since 1970. And let's turn over to the bond side where we were hurt so badly, about 14% was wiped off global bond portfolios. Scott, a lot of investors are in moderate type strategies, 60-40 type of strategies. Do you think it's dead right now? Yeah, let's let's talk about the fear mongering that I hear across the board from major media about the 60-40 investor being dead. Painful living fear, isn't it? And let's first identify what is that investor. That investor has 60% of their dollars in equities very similar to an aggressive investor or a a super aggressive investor that owns equities. They're just owning a lower percentage of. The 40% though is in fixed income. And that's really where the focus should be. We watched interest rates rise an unprecedented amount from inflation that was seen at levels haven't seen in decades. So it should be no surprise that on the longer end of the curve, those bonds, durations, intermediate, long-term are going to get hit pretty hard, especially on the treasuries. We saw that happen in the first half of the year. That discounting in the bond market happened immediately. It was swift. And that 60-40 investor got hit on both sides. That hadn't been seen in decades. Does that mean the 60-40 investor is dead? No, of course not. When I look at the modeling that I'm doing right now for our investors, I'm actually seeing some opportunities to create better income. Income with lower risk. I went way over my time. Time's up. I'm sorry I went into yours, but I have a feeling that's going to be okay. Well, the good thing is on my side, (laughs) great. So I'm really just going to be adding on to what you said. Uh, 2022 was unusual and 60-40 portfolio. Let's break that down. And you already did. I'm just going to add on. I want to focus on the 40%, which is fixed income. Let's think negatively. Okay, negative is we may move in the environment, interest rates higher, which can hurt bonds inverse. We talked about in the previous show. But here are some reasons to be positive about the future of bonds. Right now, Scott, aren't the yields higher? And maybe there's some undervalue in bonds right now. And doing some of the things that you just talked about and you're doing tactical decisions inside that 40% could be potential positions in floating rate or inflation protected positions. Those tactical moves could be 
reallocate inside the bond area. And moderate strategy going forward, a history of bonds. Why are people maybe in a 60-40 strategy? They'd be more moderate. I'm going to go with moderate. <laughs> and potentially attempt to limit volatility and losses. We're not going to turn our heads away from six months and say that 40% is done. We can navigate it. There are some opportunities going forward. And in the long run, bonds have shown that they can potentially be less volatile than stocks. So I do not think it's dead. And that's where we stand. We agree. It's a miracle. You believe in miracles? Yeah, yeah we agree. On. And to have an extra 10 seconds on this, markets are in cycles. We peak, we trough, we peak again. They don't start and stop. So investors really do have to be able to look out and have some perspective as to where we are right now and not get caught up on the everyday noise. Yes, but let's go to the emails. Our long-term investors. Yeah, so that's right, Matt. Let's go you. to the emails because I got one yesterday. That's a great email, and I wanted to bring it out today. Um, we have a client uh, who's looking to retire uh, in one to two years and potentially stop renting and buying a home, their retirement home down in Florida. Is now the right time to be doing that, Matt? Great question. What's the theme of this meeting, of this event, and this presentation? That it sounds like customization. So. I think you're going to touch probably more on the housing market right now. I'm going to talk about customizing that decision for the client. So that client moving to Florida, I see two evaluations when someone's making that decision about buying or moving for a home. First is the upfront cost. I'm going to go through, and I just did this with a client the other day, what's the potential down payment? There's going to be settlement charges. And Scott, do you know anyone that's ever moved into a home and didn't have some one-time payments for furniture, TV, or other updates to their house. So we got to go through that situation with the client. Can they afford the upfront cost? Then we move to the future project projection or cash flow. Are they moving from a place right now where they're renting? How much more is the cost going to be going forward for the mortgage, real estate taxes, homeowners insurance, or other potential costs they would have? So making that decision with a client, we want to look at those two evaluations to see can the client afford it up front? And then going forward, we don't want them being house poor. Oh, we can cover the bills, but then they're eating ramen noodle soup every night for dinner because they can't afford to save or do other things in their life. What do you think, Scott? Let's talk about the housing market. Rates are going up. This morning, July 20th, we saw mortgage originations fall to a 22-year low. We watched real estate market go from what I would call irrational where you had bidding that was over ask. No, just make it 45. Is it even worth that? 50. I don't know. To high percentages, you had open houses that weren't even getting to the open house. You had a lot of irrational behavior that was occurring uh, for a period of time. And that has started to fizzle out, uh, maybe not everywhere, but we've, sit, we've seen that across the board. Uh, we've also watched contracts get canceled at, at a higher rate than many, many years in the past. So I think that from a standpoint of the housing market, demand is getting is having a bite being taken out of it right now. Pre-qualified. I'll pay cash. I got cash. 20, uh, 30. In part from the Fed. By slowing down the economy, slowing down in hopes inflation, this is bringing the entire economy to a, not a grinding halt, but it is slowing. Remember, the majority of the economy is the consumer, which has very strong balance sheets. As you mentioned before, Matt, good job market. Workers are making money, earning money, and spending money, but they're spending it often uh, in those higher inflationary items that are deemed necessities. So when I'm looking at the housing market right now and I'm talking to potential buyers or sellers, uh, I'm not only talking about the planning aspect, which I do believe is of equal importance, but also the timing of that transaction which we have to be looking at the overall market. If you're going out to borrow money, are you comfortable borrowing at five and a half to 6% when it was half of that just 12, 18 months ago? Scott, thank you. You came in hot today. It's hot outside. I think we probably used up our time, which that's our job is to go over and complain about it later. Investors out there, don't forget to stay focused, stay disciplined, and stay tuned for the next episode of The Bash.